In this video, we are going to begin our analysis of loops. In particular, we are going to start with for loops. We will later move on to analyzing while loops, which are a little more sophisticated in how we have to approach them. Here we have a very simple code snippet. This code, we want to try to identify how long does it take? That is the motivation behind everything we have done. We finally cleared all of the hurdles in terms of prerequisites to be able to quantify how long this code takes. The way we're going to analyze code like this is we're going to associate some constant amount of time to each line of code. So we're going to assume that every execution of line one takes some constant amount of time C1. Notice in your computer, this should theoretically be true somewhere under the hood. Similarly, every execution of line two takes roughly the same amount of time. You're going to assign I to one on the first iteration, so maybe that one's a little different. But then you're going to add one to I, then check if it's less than or equal to 25. So that second line of code, every execution takes C2, but it executes more than once. So we'll need to wrangle with that. Similarly for line three, it's embedded inside of a for loop. It has some fixed amount of time that it takes to do the retrieval of X, the retrieval of I, the addition of X and I, and the assignment of X plus I back to X. All that takes some amount of time, but it's a constant amount of time each iteration. It's the same operations every time. So we want to try to count how many times do these lines of code run. If I know the cost of each run of the code, C1, C2, and C3, and tell you the number of times that they occur, that is sufficient for understanding the running time. So the time here, the first line of code only executes once. So that's C1. The second line of code, you can be careful with your counting here, it executes 25 times, or 25-ish. We'll deal with the specifics later. So it happens 25 times, and we have C2. And then we have another 25 times, the Im most embedded statement inside of the, that for loop executes the same number of times as the for loop. So that looks like the time. Notice the coefficient for 25C2 and 25C3 are exactly the same. That should theoretically always be the case. So rather than dealing with two different constants, one way that we might deal with this is to combine those into a single constant to simplify things. You could theoretically look up these constants though. You could Google for your specific set of hardware, how long does assignment take? How long does adding take? How long does less than or equal to take? How long does retrieval take? How long do each of the things that the code must do take? And then directly time it. We're going to see how to modify this when we take a variable amount of time, because notice that loop runs a fixed amount of time. Your code will never do this in practice. You're going to have some function which takes an array as input, a graph as input, some data structure as input, and then processes that data structure. So let's look at some more accurate code. Here's the same code snippet, but we have now replaced that 25 with an n. So the exact same sort of analysis occurs where we have C1. And then to simplify myself, rather than having C2 and C3, both of which were measuring the same thing, how many times does the for loop run? I'm going to just write C2. And that corresponds to both two and three there. How many times do both of those lines of code execute? So the time here, which now is going to be a function of n, will be the time it takes that first line of code, plus just like we saw before when it ran 25 times, this runs n times. This is n times C2. And now if we want to be able to determine the asymptotic complexity of that, the reason we have asymptotic notation is for quantifying these types of things. You can probably look at that and go, yeah, that's definitely in theta of n. It's a constant plus a constant times n. So t of n is in theta of n. Notice that C1 isn't doing a lot. It happens once and n large enough means that that C1 is always irrelevant. So why on earth are we even including it? A more practical way to deal with this would have been to just scrap the C1 entirely. Let's do that. And now why am I even calling it C2? Why not call it C? So in practice, this is how we are going to analyze the code. We're going to, for the loop, write the cost of the line of code inside of the loop. In this case, that C is corresponding roughly to either both I equals one to N and X equals X plus I, each one of those operations. Although in practice, we could just make it associated with line three of the code there. So in practice, 
we're letting the innermost line of code, the one that is most embedded inside of the loop, be the thing that governs the runtime. This would all be well and good, but code isn't that interesting to analyze when it has a single loop. So let's see what happens when we have two loops. How can we analyze this? Hmm. Let's try and see what we can do. We know exactly how to analyze the code I just highlighted. That is effectively the same code we just had. We changed I to J, and the arithmetic is slightly different, but the same reasoning holds. So if I let C be the running time of that line of code, then all of the stuff in that mint green color there takes CN time. But that's not quite everything. Instead of just CN, we also have this outer loop. Hmm. We're going to need to make a more sophisticated notation. We're going to see this even more with our next example, but something weird is going on here. What I'm going to do is I'm going to manually track what happens. I goes from one to N. So when I equals one, we can know what that code does. The code in green takes C N time. When I equals two, it does the same thing. When I equals three, it does the same thing all the way up until i equals n, it's cn. So if I want to know the total amount of time, I know what it does when i equals 1, i equals 2, i equals 3, and i equals n. We could add up each of those times and write this as the sum from i equals 1 to n of cn, which is, for all purposes, cn is a constant. i does not care about n. I is the only variable that matters inside of that summation. So we have some fixed quantity that we are adding up a fixed number of times. So the number of terms is the top bound minus the bottom bound plus one times the thing inside. So this equals cn squared. Now you may have been able to do this on your own. However, in practice, it's going to need to be a summation. We'll see this more with our next couple of examples that we work through, but there's no way around using a summation here for some of these problems. So this idea of translating the code into a summation is going to be our main approach. Let's look at one more example before we dive into more complicated problems. In the next example, we've changed that J equals one to N to J equals one to I. And now things are actually looking more interesting. So, we can now look at this innermost code here. Well, just as we saw in the past, we could theoretically just say, well, that code runs I times the thing inside takes constant time. But let's try and generalize what we're doing so that we can write it in as consistent of a way as possible. Before, we knew that the body of the outer for loop took CN time. And then we added up that CN every single time. Here, if we zoom in, the body of the loop takes constant time. So I can write the running time of this mint code here as the sum from j equals 1 to i of c. Take that constant time for j equals 1 and j equals 2 and j equals 3 and j equals 4 all the way up until i and add it up. Notice this gives me the same thing, ci as we were doing before of just looking at the code and counting. However, now we have a consistent way of representing a for loop as a summation. Now we know that each run of this outer for loop takes CI time. So let's create that little table that we had before. When I equals one, it's going to take C time. And then when I equals two, it's going to take two C time when I equals Three, it's going to take 3c time when i equals n, it's going to take n times c time. That's what we have. We know it takes ci time, and we know the values of i goes 1, 2, 3, 4, up until n. So just like we did before, we could write that as a summation. In general, we will always translate a for loop directly into a summation with the exact same bounds. So this code here can be directly translated into the sum from i equals 1 to n of ci. 
just like we saw before, rather than CN, we have CI here. It is the same thing. No, we normally wouldn't do this in this way. We normally sort of combine this all into one coherent step. So if I have T of N, the time for a input of size N, that's equal to that outer for loop I would represent as a sum from one to N. The inner for loop I would represent as a sum from one to I. And inside it takes constant time. You represent for loops as summations. And the thing that goes inside is the cost of executing that single line of code. This line of code, again, does the same thing every time. It does assignment and addition and subtraction and retrieval, all of that. So it takes some constant amount of time every time. And now we have a set of summations to analyze. So we always begin when we have multiple summations with the innermost summation. So we begin with that summation and then work our way outwards. So we're going to leave that sum from one to n untouched. And then we need to find the number of terms. The number of terms of that summation is the top bound minus the bottom bound plus one times c. So t of n is equal to the sum from i equals one to n of ci. You might be able to identify that that is an arithmetic sum. An arithmetic sum you can use a formula for if we can get it into our exact form. So I can factor C out of the summation and we have T of N is equal to C times the sum from I equals one to N of I. We've seen that summation a couple of times already. We should hopefully have some vague sense of what that converges to. It converges to N times N plus one divided by two. So this is equal to C times N times N plus one divided by two. And now we have an, a successful count of the number of times that that innermost line of code executes. And because that innermost line of code, the one I associated this cost C with, this line of code there, because that is the most embedded line of code, it will be the most impactful in terms of the running time of this algorithm. So this is maybe not the exact running time, but asymptotically speaking, it is by far the most important term. So T of N, the running time as a function of N, is equal to that expression. And maybe you look at this and go, yeah, I can tell that that's in theta of N squared. So this code takes theta N squared time. So T of N is equal to theta of N squared. And maybe we highlight that just so the reader can easily find their answer. Notice we directly translated the for loops into summations. We will always be doing this. This is the crux of our technique. It's why we learned our summations. It's why we learned how to bound summations. And we are expressing our runtimes in terms of theta to be able to ignore many of these constants that appear. It's why we introduced the asymptotic notation. So all the material from our class is building into these problems. We want to write running times of code as summations then analyze those summations by either using closed form expressions, as we've done here, or by bounding those summations above and below. That is what we are going to be doing going forward.